The purpose of the kidney, of course, is to remove waste in the form of nitrogen, nitrogenous waste. And the reason it's able to do that is that it can move things um, through a process of osmosis. So waste gets dissolved in water and water follows salt. We call that osmosis. We learned about that last year. And that's how the kidney can get rid of waste in the form of urine. The problem, of course, is that the kidney wants to do it with a minimum loss of salt and water. So it has to have a process to take back most of that salt and water and still get rid of the nitrogen waste. And um, it's all based on the idea of osmosis, which we learned about last year. So I wanted to kind of uh, just review a little bit about what osmosis is so we can understand how the kidney is going to use this process to get rid of nitrogen waste. So two ideas, first of all. Uh, let's start off with the idea of uh, osmosis itself. You learned this last year. Osmosis is the movement of water from high to low across a semi-permeable membrane. So that's really important that it's semi-permeable. So only a living thing, an animal or a plant or a fungi, would have a membrane. And semi-permeable means that some things can go across it, but other things can't. And we also learned last year that there were channel proteins embedded inside these membranes, which allow it to be semi-permeable. Now, the idea of water moving from high to low is a little bizarre. I mean, you don't think about one thing as having more water than another, but it actually does in the terms of salt. So if something is uh, really salty, therefore it has less water, water concentration is low. If it has very little salt in it, uh, it would have a very high water concentration. So if you have trouble of thinking about water from going to high to low, think about it as uh, water moving from a low salt to a high salt in order to dilute that salt. Which then brings us to the second thing, which is tonicity. And tonicity means the amount of salt something has. So it's, it's kind of the opposite idea. And uh, something can have a lot of salt and uh, something can have a little salt, but this time um, how a semi-permeable membrane acts is differently because uh, salt has trouble moving across it. So if it can move across it though, the movement of salt down it would go from a concentration gradient from high to low. And we'll learn later on that uh, one salt doesn't really care about what another salt is doing. So tonicity means the movement of salt down a concentration gradient across, once again, a semi-permeable membrane. So those are kind of our definitions that we need to start off with. Now let's look at, we gotta do some math involved here. And um, I don't think you're going to have really a lot of math on an IB exam, but uh, it kind of helps you to understand what's going on. And this uh, should be reviewed from what you learned last year in uh, chemistry or two years ago. So first of all, molecular weight, right? Molecular weight means the number of grams you have for every mole. And you can go ahead and find that out really easily just by looking at the periodic table. So for example, the molecular weight of carbon, if I look at it, element number six, it should be 12 which means that there are 12 grams for every one mole of carbon. A Little bit of math here. If molecular weight equals grams divided by moles, we can cross multiply molecular weight of moles so you can get an equation for the number of moles. So the number of moles of something would be how many grams you have of it divided by the molecular weight. For example, suppose I had 12 grams of carbon. Since the molecular weight is 12, 12 divided by 12 means that that would be one mole. Then we go to molarity. Now molarity means concentration, right? So concentration in terms of liters, right? So let's suppose that I had two uh, moles of, uh, of carbon, and if I divided it in one liter, then I'd have a molarity of two molarity. That's a really high concentration. Now last year or two years ago in chemistry, you dealt with things that were like acids that were six molar or something like that. These are really strong concentrations you'd find in chemistry and biology. You don't find those sort of levels. You find a much, much smaller unit, which we call millimoles, right? Which means one thousandth. So in other words, there's one thousand millimoles in one uh, mole. So uh, just to give you an example here, uh, our bodies, as far as salt, our bodies here are probably on the order of about, uh, I think it's 150 
millimoles, right, of sodium chloride, right, which is about 0.9%. So pretty much biological things on the order of millimole. Okay, so far so good. That should have been review from last year from chemistry. Now we're going to move on to some things a little different. Instead of using uh, millimoles or molarity, we're going to use an idea called osmolality. Osmolality. It's pretty simple jump we're going to make. All osmolality means is you take the molarity of something and you multiply it by the number of particles. The number of particles. So, for example, sodium chloride, which is NaCl, if you go ahead and dissolve that in water, it actually disassociates into two particles, sodium and chloride. So we would say that sodium chloride really has two particles. So if I said, for example, that my blood was 150 millimolar, the osmolality of it would actually be 150 times 2 would be 300 millimole. And we would call that milliosmolality again, which is a one thousandth. Not everything's like that. All things which are held together by covalent bonds, for example, like a sugar, glucose, would be all covalent bonds. So one mole of uh, sugar is the same as one osmole of it because there's only one particle of sugar because it's all covalently held together. That's going to be important later on. Okay, so let's talk about how do we figure out how many particles are in something. What has one particle, right? Well, anything held together by covalent bond, all sugars, all proteins, amino acids, all gases like CO2, uh, urea. Urea is a really interesting uh, molecule we're gonna learn about later on that the blood is filled with. That's kind of how we're gonna get rid of nitrogenous waste. And of course, water. All these things are one molar. So if I said, for example, I have some protein and I have uh, one millimole of protein, you would say, well, you still have one osmole millimole, um, osmolality of it, because one particle, so one times one is still one. What has multiple particles in it, right? So what has multiple particles? Well, salts, just as I demonstrated. So, for example, sodium chloride, sodium and chloride, that would be two particles. So whatever the uh, molality of it, you'd multiply by two to get the osmolality. How about this one, calcium chloride? Now, that actually disassociates into three. There's one calcium and there's two chloride. So that has three particles. So you'd have to multiply by three. Next thing. What's permeability? Who is permeable, who is not? When we say a semi-permeable membrane, who do we know who can get across and who cannot? Well, who cannot? Hey, salts like sodium chloride, they cannot go through a biological membrane. And neither can big stuff like sugars, although sugars can get uh, through a living membrane with facilitate transport, but passively they can't and proteins can't and amino acids can't. Who can go through without any help down a concentration gradient? Well, water, obviously, that's why we have osmosis, gases, and this guy who's going to be super important, urea. And that's going to be the key to understanding how the kidney works. Okay, finally, a few terms so we all understand. We should have learned these last year. Last year, you learned that hypertonic meant you have lots of salt and therefore little water. They're the opposite. You should have learned last year that hypotonic means little salt but lots of water. And you should have learned that isotonic means the same salt as the surroundings. So, for example, last year we did uh, the log thrown in the ocean. Now, the ocean has a lot of salt. The log does not have much salt. So, if the log does not have much salt, it must have lots of water. And in comparison, the ocean, which has a lot of salt, actually has less water. So, the log, the log would consider to be hypotonic it has less salt than the ocean got the idea okay and isotonic means same right now this year i want you to not so much talk about hypertonic but use the other definitions which incorporate the idea of particles right so instead of saying hypertonic we're going to say hypoosmotic hypoosmotic and isoosmotic and the difference again from here to here is 
we're talking about the number of particles. And that's going to be really important later on when we understand the kidney. Okay, everybody have your worksheet? Let's go ahead and do a few together here so that you know how to do it. And I think for the uh, sake of, uh, of time here, I'm just going to do one and I'll let you fill out the rest of them. So, first of all, you would need to go ahead, find the molecular weight. How do we find the molecular weight? We look at the periodic table. Now, some of you should remember some of these. Hydrogen, I remember that. That's one, right? And carbon, I just told you, is 12, right? And oxygen, we should know, is what? 16. And you should be able to figure out the rest of them. You just look at the periodic table. Next thing. Give the molecular weight for a whole compound. It's really easy to do. Remember, we learned this in chemistry. You just count up the number of atoms, and if you know the molecular weight for each atom, you should be able to figure it all out. Hey, let's do sodium chloride, shall we? Now, sodium, let's see, sodium, well, actually, I can't remember what sodium is. Let's do, uh, how about water? I can do that one, yeah? H2O, that's easy. Two hydrogens, two times one is two, plus oxygen. That must have been 18. That was easy, and I'll let you figure out the rest of them there. Let's go on to the next page. Now, remember all those equations I asked you to write down? So now we're going to do it backwards. How would you figure out the number of moles if you knew the grams and you knew the molecular weight? Let's do this one here, water, right? I just told you that the molecular weight of water was 18, right? So how do we figure out if we have 36 grams of water, how many moles it is? Well, if I've got 36 grams, right, and I know the molecular weight is 18, 36 divided by 18, someone have a calculator out there? Uh, I could do that on my hands. That would be two moles. Lousy looking two, but that's the idea. Let you figure out the rest of them. Let's try D. And finally, now that we know the number of moles, let's go ahead and convert it into a concentration unit, which is molarity. How about this one? 10 moles of hydrochloric acid equals five liters. Here's our equation, right? The number of moles equals, uh, no, excuse me, the molarity equals moles divided by liter. Really easy. What do we got? I got 10 moles of hydrochloric acid, and it's divided by 5 liters. And if you still have your calculators with you, that should be an answer of 2 molarity, which is really, really big. Okay? We don't want to cancel that. Okay, I'll let you figure out the last one here. Now this one here, grams of that, you're going to have to convert it to moles first and then use the equation here. Let's go on to E. Now, finally, knowing that osmolarity or osmolality means molarity times particles, calculate the osmolality for each solution. So let's go ahead and do it. So let's suppose I have a molarity which is 2 molar sodium chloride and I know that osmolality equals molarity times particles. How many particles in this? There are two particles. One is sodium and one is chloride. 2 times 2 means I have uh, osmolality of 4. Now this one is easier, right? Wow, that's uh, only one particle in urea. So 2 times 1 means you have two osmolality. Sorry about my lousy handwriting, but that's the idea. Finally, let's go down here to uh, F. Okay, compare each solution to 100 milliosmolar sodium chloride. Assume a permeable membrane. Decide if the solution is hyperosmotic, isoosmotic, or hypoosmotic. Then decide if it's hypertonic, isotonic, or hypertonic, and draw a picture for each to show the movement of water. Wow, this is going to be hard. So let's go ahead and see. Suppose I have a situation like this where I have a semi-permeable membrane and we've got this guy over here which is 300 milliosmolar sodium chloride and over here you have a solution which is 100 milliosmolar sodium chloride. Okay, same thing. This one, remember, was 300, and this one, they said, was 100. Well, that's really easy. So we're going to compare this guy here against this guy. 300 is more than 100. Therefore, we would say this guy is hyperosmotic. 
hyperosmotic, right? And which way would water move? Water moves from low salt to high salt or from high water to low water, so water would move this way. The water moves from this solution to try and dilute the more salt in here, and actually the water level would then rise here and would fall down here, right? Because the salt cannot go back and forth, okay? All right, uh, I'm gonna let you try and figure out this worksheet as you've got it here, and then uh, we'll try one more, which is really hard, and I'll let you go and then try the other worksheet, probably as homework, but maybe you have time for it. So let's do one more here. And this one will set you up for the other uh, assignment I have for you. Once again, we want to figure out, very simple, which way does water move? Okay, let's look at this side here first of all. Uh, urea and 0.9 grams glucose. First thing is, you cannot use grams. So we need to convert that sugar from grams into moles. Let's assume one liter here, by the way. And I went ahead and cheated. The reason I did it as 0.19 grams is because it's 190 grams per mole here, right? So I thought I'd cheat a little bit here. So this guy is actually then 100, I'm sorry, 100, uh, 100 millimoles of glucose. Okay, so that's it. So now you have 100 millimoles of glucose, right? And we have uh, 100 millimoles of urea and 50 millimoles of sodium chloride. Well, first of all, we got to figure out, can anyone get across this membrane? Sodium chloride cannot. Glucose cannot, but urea can. Urea doesn't care about anybody else, so it's going to move across the membrane down its concentration gradient. How far does it move? Until half of it goes across here. So you got... 50 millimolar, right? And 50 is left. Urea goes down its concentration gradient, doesn't care about anybody else. Okay, are we done here? Is this 50 and 50 and that's 100 and that's 50 and 100, that's 150, are we done? No, we're not, because remember, remember, this guy here has two particles, so it's not really 50, it's really 100. Now we're done. 50 and 100 is 150, 50 and 100 is 150, and so which way does water move? It doesn't move at all. Wow, that was about as hard a problem as you can get. Uh, why don't you finish the first worksheet and then go ahead and try the second one and see if you can figure out which way water moves on the eight problems.